lie down, the kid, the calf, and the lion, and the fat lip together, and a little child shall lead them. It is an exquisite image, an awesome vision. The peaceable kingdom, natural enemies living in harmony, all being led by a child. Isaiah, the poet prophet, paints pictures of God's contract with humanity, God's future that is to become our future. Isaiah foresees what is to come, reminds us of what wonders we have to look forward to. I know there are two major objections to this text. It is not real. It is not reasonable. As Woody Allen put it, the lion and the lamb will lie down together, but the lamb won't get much sleep. <laughs> These are wishful thinking, picture words. Everybody knows that in the real world, when the leopard lies down with the kid, the kid does not get back up. D.H. Lawrence noted that the lion won't lie down with the lamb unless the lamb is inside the lion. Reason and reality tell us that a little chill wild cannot lead a wolf on a leash without ending up as a dead child. Heaven knows we want to be reasonable. We need to live in the real world. We need to face facts. The world chews up and spits out visionary dreamers, Gandhi, King, Kennedy, Romero, Biko. There's no denying Isaiah's vision is wonderfully pastoral and quaint. His imagined world would be a great place to live. But get your head out of the clouds and your feet on the ground. Wolf and lamb, leopards and kids, a little child, yeah. And the Jews and Palestinians are going to live in peace and harmony. And Democrats and Republicans will cross the aisle and actually pass legislation for the good of the country. Get real. Be reasonable. There's a crucial question to be asked of. Just whose reason are we to abide? Whose definition of reality are we to buy into? What's real is considerably more contested than we may like to admit. And what's reasonable is in the eye of the beholder. There really is no such thing as detached, universally shared reason. A reason that is innately available to everyone. Eric Erickson knew it. He wrote, reality, of course, is man's most powerful illusion. Intellectual objectivity is a myth. We all think about the world from some particular point of view. View life through some prism. Set up our tent in some ideological camp. Whenever we claim we are being objective, reasonable, it usually indicates that we are ignorant about the ways that our ethnic, economic, political background has rendered our particular way of sensing reality. We assume that our view is reality. Our thinking is greatly determined by where we have been and what we expect to see. Have you ever taken a friend from Pine Bluff or Cedar Rapids or some other place out there somewhere to visit New York City for the first time and witness the, the incredulity on their faces? Would you look at that? I've never seen anything like this before. I can't believe my ears what I'm hearing. Pine Bluff is not New York. There is reality and then there is reality. That's why we're in church on a Sunday, in a never-ending effort to better see God's way. It's a way of seeing things which is peculiar, odd, 
doesn't make sense to a whole lot of people and takes a whole boatload of Sundays to get any good at it. And the reason some folk hold on to what they think is a universally held reason is that reality is not fixed, closed. It's their particular point of view who happens to be so conventional that way, that's wonderful. They assume that everyone else sees the world just like they do. They're not being reasonable or realistic. They're really just suffering from a lack of imagination or from staying too long in one room. And usually, the louder the shout to be reasonable, the greater the ideological blindness. What do you think lies at the root of our systemic racism in our country? We white folk think that because the way we see the world is the way everybody absolutely sees the world. No. Is it reasonable to foresee a time when the wolf shall lie with the lamb? Is it realistic to imagine the calf and the lion and the fat live together and that a little child shall lead them? Well, that depends a great deal on what sort of world we live in. If our world is destined for nothing but survival of the fittest and random acts of violence signifying nothing, then that vision of a day when lambs and lions will frolic together will seem wholly fantastic, if not downright ignorant. On the other hand, if we truly do believe that this world and its future belong to God, that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, then Isaiah's reality isn't so fantastic and certainly not ignorant. Be very suspicious of people that tell you, now be realistic, face facts. They're attempting by claiming such confident knowledge of what is to circumvent debate and stifle imaginative thinking. The facts are not that factual. What would happen if Leonardo da Vinci had listened to all those folks telling him to be realistic? Or the Wright brothers? Or Rosa Parks? Or Nelson Mandela? Or Jesus? Too often in modern conversation, truth is greatly reduced, accommodated to the conventional reasons of the age, appeals to be realistic, beg the question of just who's defining what's real and what group benefits from that definition. We are in desperate need of a larger, more imaginative modes of thought, of reason that is pushy, dramatic, capable of invention and imagination, thoroughly unimpressed with the alleged division between fact and fiction. Reduced thought leads to reduced lives. The wolf shall lie with the lamb. The calf and the lion and the fat live together, and a little child shall lead them. The question for us this Advent morning is not whether we ought to be realistic, but what are the realities? Before you blow off Isaiah's vision of a peaceable kingdom of wolves and lions and child leaders as unrealistic and irrational, consider that the prophet may be inviting you into a counter-rationality. Another reality, just maybe the ultimate reality. Isaiah the poet urges us to define people in terms of what they desire, that for which they long. What are you waiting for? What are you longing for this advent? Will wolves and lambs dwell together? Is it possible for a child to know more than the joint Jesus there? 
It makes all the difference what sort of world you believe we have. How far you are able to see and above all what sort of God we have. Martin Luther King Jr. began one of his sermons with this assertion. At the center of the Christian faith is the conviction that in the universe there is a God of power who is able to do exceedingly abundant things in nature and in history. It will make all the difference in the world whether or not you believe that. We are dying, you and I, for a dearth of realism about the power of the Lamb and the future of the baby. Today's Isaiah poetry offers us another world a world ruled not by savvy politicians or tough-as-nails generals or Wall Street withers, but by a little child. All is at peace. All is calm. All is bright. Even our old enemy, the serpent, is soothed by this child. Way back in 1533, in a sermon for this second Sunday of Advent, Martin Luther admits that it is a, quote, ridiculous thing that the true God, the high majesty, should be made human. Reason opposes this with all its might, he goes on. Hear these wise thoughts with which our reason soars up toward heaven to see God in majesty and to probe how God reigns there on high are stripped from us. The goal is fixed elsewhere, so that I should run from all the corners of the world to Bethlehem, to that stable and that manger where the babe lies. Yes, that subdues reason. There it comes down before my eyes, so that I can see the babe there in his mother's lap. Where then are the wise? Who could ever have conceived this or thought it out? Reason must bow and must confess her ignorance in that she wants to climb to heaven to fathom the divine while she cannot see what lies before her eyes in the manger. We too think that what we need are strong armies a wall to keep those illegals out, lots of presents under the tree, a fat portfolio, positive results on our annual physical, straightforward answer to secure 2020. Isaiah offers only a lion and a lamb lying together to help us think things through again, and a baby to lead us home. Get real, Isaiah. Be reasonable. To which Isaiah replies, Oh, don't worry about me. And Catholic priest and De poet Daniel Berrigan said in this way in his Advent Credo, It is not true that creation and the human family are doomed to destruction and loss. This is true. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is not true that we must accept in humanity discrimination, <coughs> hunger and poverty, death and destruction. This is true. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. It is not true that violence and hatred should have the last word and that war and destruction rule forever. This is true. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Lord, the Prince of Peace. It is not true that we are simply victims of the powers of evil who seek to rule the world. This is true. To me is given all authority in heaven and on earth, and lo, I am with you until the end of the world. So let us journey, Advent in hope, even hope against hope. 
Let us see visions of love and justice and peace. Let us affirm with humility, with joy, with faith, with courage, Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Reasonable? God says absolutely. Amen?